All right, so our next speaker is Leland Schoen. Leland is driven by his desire for ranchers to gain more wealth for the land. You get a chance to visit with Leland, and I've known Leland a long time. Um, you might find that gra grazing critters he is referring to are those in the soil. From the grazing perspective, it is rekindling the relationship with landscapes and livestock. He's over 30 years of career with the USDA NRCS. He is a range science degree from North Dakota State University and a farm ranch management credit from Dickinson State University. So he's well-trained. That's right. His NRCS career has taken him from North Dakota to the Bighorn Basin in Wyoming. In his last 20 years, he's been at South Dakota. Most of his career, he's served as a district conservationist. He's currently a rangeland management specialist in the Rapid City Field Support Center. He keeps his technical skills acute by applying grazing management to land with sheep and cattle on his land with the help from his wife and five children. He must be getting older, though, by now, huh? Yep, 9 to 18. Leland is a keen observer of native rangeland and applies his motto of learn, practice, and teach, believing that having practical application as a rancher gives him credibility to be a great teacher and coach. Leland's talk today is thinning out smooth brown grass invasion. So welcome, Leland. All right, thank you. Yeah, thanks, Kevin. Um, it's great to be back, I guess, on campus. To be honest, I graduated in 95, and this is the first time I've actually been in a building since 95 um, on campus, but um, definitely a Bison fan. So just, um, I always teach my kids, you know, when you have a presentation, you want to give a good attention getter. So, um, you know, this is it. Um, I'm going to ask you this. What's the big deal about Big Blue Stem? With the appropriate pause, it, it makes you... Think about, um, you know, is it really a big deal? Or are two species such as western wheatgrass and big blue stem just, you know, what we know of as the, as the native smooth brome grass and, and Kentucky, Kentucky bluegrass compared to what we originally had? That's just my attention getter. I've got so much to, to offer in so little time, um, but I really appreciate this opportunity just to share an experience, you know, based on some information that I had and studied and, and, and stuff. So I, I I have notes, otherwise I get too off track, and I probably will anyways, because what I'm better at doing is small groups or individual interaction. And some of you that know me well is if you ask me a question, I'm probably going to ask you about three back before we come to a conclusion. And that way we both learn instead of me just regurgitating stuff you know, that I've learned academically or that I've seen on site. But uh, what I, I'm passionate about is to share my experiences with you because it's going to change the difference of our bluegrass and our smooth bromegrass invasions. And uh, so, you know, this last two um, sessions really set me up well. And if I were to ask you to ask the same questions that you did of Rachel, um, I'd have some, some answers of which, you know, some were already offered, but um, there's some cool things. So I'm wasting time here. So thank you again for the introduction. Um, I left here in 95. And uh, I went to Napoleon, North Dakota was my first office I went to. And it really set the foundation. I had a really good DC that he didn't have to push very hard, but he pushed me in the field. I got, you know, my boots on the ground. I really saw what I learned academically applied on the land. And that really set a fantastic, um, my career up very well. Um, I partnered a lot and I value a lot in partnerships, the conservation districts over the years, Ducks Unlimited, Partners for Wildlife with U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service and the Grassland Coalitions. Um, you know, we're all trying to figure out, you know, this non-native cool season invasive thing. And uh, whether it be bluegrass, crested, or whatever. Um, during these years, I continue to study and read and work at the Mandan ARS, or I've re looked at their work, Dickinson Research Extension Center. And uh, basically what I'm trying to say is all the solutions are right here in the NDSU repository library. They really are. If you dig in and you find them like you offered, you know, with whether it's Kirby's stuff, or Sedevic stuff or current stuff, you know, it's all right here. We just need to get in there and look at it. And I've done a lot of that over my 30 year career. And so I think where credit is due, where you're gonna see me go here is the twice over rotational grazing strategy. And it's work that's been done by Dr. Llewellyn Mansky out of Dickinson Research Extension Center. And his work is at the repository as well as other places. And that's where, where I really think, um, at least where, I've, where it's led me is where I wanna give credit to. So with that, What's the problem, right? If you've been in the field long enough, you've seen this dark green cancer that's trying to spread across our native rangeland. It's a monoculture native smooth brome that does that. And somewhere, I've had 31 years of career with NRCS, about my 15th year, I'm just sick and tired of it. I'm sick and tired of hearing the same old 
solution that's not working. And so what we're trying to do is repopulate the native soil organisms through grazing strategies. And what I want to offer here to the left is um, it's climate field view, which is a satellite um, information that's used mostly on agronomy. But I had the fortune as I worked with a lot of different ranchers, as I asked them this, I said, there's some way, because there's just not enough range cons in the world to really go and really evaluate the rangeland. I said, there's got to be a satellite way for us to look at indicators you know, from a computer screen or whatever. So then we can go out there and see what's happening. So I met um, Hancock's, I think it was in 2018. They listened to me at a little conference and they asked me to their place. And so prior to 2018, they basically had a two pasture deal where, where they're rotating cows. It wasn't very intentional at all. And just focus on this right here. So May 4th, what should be happening in May 4th, right? A lot of cool season invasives. Dark green patch here, smooth brome grass invasion. I started working with them in 2018. We implemented the grazing strategy to really stimulate soil biology in native rangeland. You know, that was in 2019 is when we started. By 2022, you can start seeing a change. Now, I didn't really notice that until I started looking at their climate field view information. Now, this is designed for, for cropland, but he says, you know, I can put these polygons wherever. We'll just put it over this section of rangeland and uh, let you play with it. And so I went out there and wanted to ground truth it. And the smooth brome grass was thinning out in four years and we're getting native species back. Primarily um, right around this area is where we've been focusing last and just paying attention the last few years is this big blue stem, the warm season component. Now, with my experience, what I learned there is, um, is what I had been seeing over all these years is, is with the right strategy that's focused on soil organisms and the proper bite, um, we're getting more native species back where we don't even have, you know, Primarily it's on, on land that hasn't been taken over by brome or whatever. We're seeing more of a 50% warm season component. So that takes me to this slide, which makes me think of Rachel's talk. Have we ever really thought about the seasonal microbial activity and what their needs are, you know, based on calendar date, starting in January, February, March, April, May, June-ish, get into September, October. It's very interesting, depending on when you choose to calve your cow, that the nutrient needs for the cow match up with the growth curve of our cool and warm season native grasses, as well as what our microbial activity is. So I just offer that as a challenge to go back and kind of try, try to line up those growth curves and those needs of the animal or the cows, as well as the microbial committee underneath the deal. We've learned really good to build habitat on the surface of the soil, but have you really thought about the habitat for our soil organisms below the surface? Okay, my rest of my story here. So by year 2013, I had been in South, South Central South Dakota for 10 years. And like I already told you this, I just tired of watching Rome take over. So, you know, what's Albert Einstein's definition of insanity? Doing the same thing over and over again and, you know, not seeing the same results or whatever. So by this time, I understood what Mansky was teaching through NDSU. I dug hundreds of soil holes and I still do. That's the best tool you can have as a sharpshooter. Um, I studied individual grass autoecology. I drew parallels of work done by Christine Jones, Michael Phillips, and John Sticka. And I'm like, these guys are all saying the same thing. And they're all born at different times, but they're saying the same thing. It all matches the research that's always, already been done in North Dakota. So in 2018, I met Van, a farmer rancher from Clome, South Dakota. He's asked a question at a grazing tour about how to get rid of smooth grown grass on native rangeland. The key speaker didn't have a good answer. And so I introduced myself and said I had some novel ideas. He was interested in giving anything a try. So let me show you what we found out. What are we doing different? This is my co-authors, by the way. Here's Van, here's his nephew, Heath. And they opened up their, their world to me on something I'd always thought about. I just needed some place to try it. Because fortunately, a lot of my career has taken me in places where we didn't have like environments that were just totally consumed with smooth brome, but he had this. So this is South Central South Dakota, still west of the Missouri River, oh, probably 60, 80 miles north of Nebraska. What we're doing here is we're ignoring smooth brome grass. Smooth brome grass, and there's a couple different types, but it's really non-mycorrhizal. So if we didn't learn anything this morning, what we should have learned at least from um, if I get his name right, Linnell's talk is the, the fungi, and he had in there specifically the mutualist. When we talk about soil organisms, there's mutualists and there's decomposers. The mutualists are the ones that are really doing the heavy lifting. 
So what Van do so different? He went to school and he got a coach. You know, that's probably the, the thing that's lacking the most in the, in the ranching industry is good coaches and consultants that know what they're doing and getting out there to really to help. He was so excited by what he was seeing just in a couple of years. I started with working with um, Van in 2018. We started working with his first grazing rotation in 2019. He was so excited what he was seeing already then. He wanted to have a pasture walk at his place. And that was in 2020. Then we followed up just last year on more on the thinning out of smooth grown grass. So let me bring that here to you. How do you make it work? Uh, basically, we ignored smooth grown grass. But when I say that, the cows don't ignore it. They're still going to eat it. Um, but we're ignoring that from just a mindset. If we didn't have brome grass or bluegrass there, how would we manage the native rangeland? One thing that's probably different that you'll see just because the amount of bi biomass from some of the brome grasses, we're stocking, whoops, we're stocking fairly heavy, heavier than what I'd typically prescribe. So I'll try to come back to that. We're using five pastures. And basically what we're doing here is if you think of it simply as we're stimulating, growing, and harvesting our, our native cool and warm season species, that's our goal. So we're using the twice over rotational grazing system and we're using the first rotation to stimulate those natives. And then um, for effort, and we saw that this morning, we're trying to grow primary and secondary tillers. So we're, that's how you rebuild a population of, of native plants. And we allow proper recovery through that growth period. And then we come back and we do our second rotation, harvesting, you know, our goal is proper management. And finally, we understand that there's fall tillers out there and uh, we don't wanna overgraze those. So stimulate, grow, harvest. Something else I've seen a lot in my career, these are van soils. You know, it's basically loamy and thin upland, but you look at these state and transition models. And basically what we're thinking is that once we have over 30% bluegrass or brome invasion, it's extremely difficult to get back into this more stable state that still has invaders. But what we're finding is we're getting back there fast. Now, I caution Van, I say, okay, we're only, we've only been at this for since 2019, and uh, we're going to get down the road here maybe five or six years, and maybe we're just going to really piss Brome off, and it's going to come back in inventions. But right now, um, where he started, um, where am I at my slides? When we started, uh, we were at least at 80% smooth Brome grass. I mean, it was really hard. I think I'm a pretty decent range kind. It was really hard to find any native species out there. It really was. And we could have probably crawled around for days, but I don't have time for that to find something. But it was mostly just smooth brome grass, okay? So, you know, we did, you know, what we should do. We did a similar index. We looked at rangeland health assessments. We implemented a plan. That's really important. I think the work or what um, Dr. Hendrickson offered us the first day was talking about these things. You, know, you need to have a plan. So we did that and we came back and we did the monitoring. And what we found um, starting in 2021 anyway, is that we're um, back up to about 42% natives. I mean, you can actually find them and you have fun looking at them and they're flowering and all the stuff is happening that we've been hearing about. So levels of disturbance, okay? I'm not a big disturbance guy. I believe in the soil health principles but I'm not big on disturbance, but this was something also, you know, a teacher for us is uh, observation. So we started this twice over rotational grazing system in 2019 and Van was really pumped about this, right? So he calls me, July 5th, and he says, Leland, he said, now what do we do? We just had a major hail event. It wiped out my soybeans, wiped out my corn. This project we're doing on the rangeland, everything's destroyed. He says, now what are we going to do? Well, what do you do when you have too much defoliation or too much disturbance on a plant? What do you do? You need to follow with recovery, right? So his fifth pasture was a, a mile and a half away from these other four pastures. And I said, have we been there yet? And he said, no, it's still in the plan. Well, I kind of knew that, but that's part of teaching. And he, I said, that's where these cows need to go. We need to have recovery on this land if we're going to try to get our native species back. And I didn't have this revelation until after this happened. All right. So I went back there about whatever it was, 10 days later after this hail event. And uh, I, was, I could see these light green patterns. I was like, this is incredible. I mean, it could have been sunlight or whatever. And I was like, this is really cool. What is this? What, what do we got going on here? Obviously, if you've been out in the cancer world, you know what this dark stuff is. It's brown. Well, green needle grass was like, Phew. all right. So like I said, we could have crawled around for days and we wouldn't have found those apical buds and things that were offered earlier this morning. But that hail event created, uh, stimulated those tillers. 
So in 2022 or 2020 and 2021, you can still see these patterns, right? And it's just getting to be more and more native, but the, oh, where am I at? I'm gonna run out of time. All right, so uh, anyways, you can ask questions if, if you have to, if you're wondering about more about that. All right, so this is where the magic happens without hail, okay? But those, you know, it's basically right here. And this is work that's been done in North Dakota. Actually, that's why I brought this book up here. It's sitting out on the table over there. And I was like, this is really cool. I want to check out this rancher's guide to grass management. Page 54 talks about grazing readiness. It's right here. It's, it's not my stuff. I mean, all this work has been done right here at this university. And, and we just need to implement it at the right time. And it's talking about timing and stages of plant physiology. Three and a half leaf stage to flowering for native grasses is what we're trying to do if we want to increase them. It releases the growth uh, regulator cytokinin, which brings about cell division, roots and shoots, this whole apple bud thing that we're talking about this morning. And you can see it in real life. All you have to do is dig the hole and you start looking. Here's Western wheatgrass. Here we have a little bud tiller. These great, these screens are awesome because you guys can see actually what's going on here. And then here's buffalo grass. The other really cool thing is not too long ago, just a few years ago, you know, we didn't dare use the word rhizosphere or rhizosheath because we, we said, you know, that's just too complex, but it's all soil organism habitat. You know, buffalo grass and western wheatgrass, you know, look at the rhizosphere or the rhizosheath that's on those roots. You know, that's the habitat, that's the home that these bugs need. And it's using the biological um, or the biological effect of grazing process is what we're referring to this, um, makes the grassland function at a biological potential for livestock weight performance for their genetic potential. What was Rachel just telling us about? the genetic potential of those cows. And this is the way we're gonna get those nutrients back in the, the gut of those ruminants. All it really is, it's as basic, it's as simple as photosynthesis management. If you go home and you say, that guy's like way over the top, just think about what do I do to keep my native grasses greener longer? It's the soil health principle that I you know, will live on and that's the active living root. Well, Leland, these are perennial species, perennial ecosystems. They're they're living roots all the time. No, they're active. That's our goal, active living roots. All right, it creates more buds and tillers, more leaves and deeper roots, more solar capture to feed soil microbes through root exudates and water infiltration. It reestablishes this rhizosphere that's really lost. If you dig as many holes as I have, you, you know what unhealthy rangeland looks like by soil aggregates and the lack of rhizosheath on these roots. So April, this is on Ban's place. Remember we started the grazing rotation in 2019. He had a veil of hail event. We recovered from that. Um, the precipitation, annual precipitation continues to decline everywhere we've been into this. So we can't control the rain. But here's a, we stimulated big blue stem. Remember just three or four years prior to that, we couldn't even find it. After 40 days of recovery, we, we have almost 2000 pounds of green biomass of big blue stem. You know, it's like, where'd that come from, right? Axillary buds, stimulated tillers. Within four years, smooth brown grass has lost vigor. Anyone knows that's been in the, in the uh, brown grass world would know that even in August, you know, where you still have porcupine grass, that's you know, a seed head there and some stuff. But anyways, you should be walking through knee high or waist high of smooth brown grass. And that's what we had. We're thinning it out. Not only are we thinning it out, but within four years, our native species diversity has restored native soil function and structure. So I could sit here and I could point out the natives. You obviously know what that one is, but native diversity in 2018, 80% smooth brome grass. 2019, um, the first natives that we're seeing come back is our cool season bunch grasses, green needle grass and porcupine grass. And by 2020, it was mostly the warm seasons that we're seeing come back, the big blue stem and side oats grama, or side oats, yeah, grama. And so some of you might be thinking, which I was thinking, I was like, well, where's the state grass of South Dakota? Where's Western? You know, he's supposed to be the increase or he's supposed to be the one that we should be showing. It was the last one to come, to come back in this smooth rome grass environment. It was in this draw that had a historic history of being overgrazed, you know, and, and uh, Heath, uh, Van's nephew, texted me a picture. He says, hey, check this out. We've got some Western wheatgrass and very small remnants is just kind of these draws in 2021. In 2022, all these other species plus Western was starting to, you could find it about any corner of the pasture on the hills, on the slopes, in the draws, whatever. So by 2022, we're up to 42% natives. We're thinning out the smooth brome grass. Um,
So it's matching, you know, the proper timing of our defoliation, especially that stimulatory period between the three and a half leaf stage and flowering and the growth stage of the native grass. So something I learned, and I hope you guys ask really hard questions. because That's the way it stretches me and learn. But the timing, so you're thinking, well, okay, so what about the brome? Cows are obviously eating the brome. But based on the information I saw this morning, if the cows are biting the brome when it's in that reproductive stage, Pete asked a good, a good follow-up question. If it's in that boot stage or whatever, what's really going to happen, let's say, two or three years from now on? You know, based on bud creation under the smooth brome grass, is that where I remember I said maybe we're going to piss it off? It's really going to you know go gangbusters. So I'm going to be receptive to that and be watching um, when these cows graze this year as far as the boot stage or reproductive stage on brome. But that's what's really cool about grazing rotations, right? We have five pastures, or you pick the number, um, and that's why we change season of use, right? So if we're looking at this as a long haul and we're just trying to find the answers this first year and we're rebuilding soil health, within four years, we're getting enough of our native plant species back and they're getting bitten at different times based on change of season of use, right? Sounds kind of like a scheduled thing, but what's really adaptive? If we want to use kind of the coin words nowadays, what's adaptive or whatever? You know what's adaptive? You know what changes a prescribed grazing schedule? Is the weather. You get frost, you get grasshoppers, you get hail, you get drought, you got whatever. That's what's adaptive. We got to do what we can with our the wisdom that we have that God's created us and, and kind of stick to the plan and mother nature or whatever you want to call it's going to, you know, throw out that adaptiveness. So we're also doing some soil sampling. You know, what do you soil sample nowadays because you don't have any money? These ranchers are paying for this. We did have a little bit of soil health money out of South Central RCD that helped us kind of get started, but we're measuring at zero to six this in the blue, six to 12 is the orange and 12 to 24. I believe in going deep because we've got plenty of science that shows that in an active root system under brome and bluegrass, we got all kinds of biological activity. That's fine and dandy. But if we're lacking root depth and density, we've got to look deeper. And all we're looking for is because it's cheap, is soil organic carbon or basically organic matter, ammonium nit nitrogen and nitrate nitrogen. So yesterday we were talking a lot about nitrogen, nutrient cycles, nitrogen, nitrogen, nitrogen. But the mutualist organisms are going to release nitrogen different than the decomposer soil organisms. And so if we're ammonium nitrate heavy, and that's what, where the decomposers you know, win, then we don't have enough protozoa to pee out their nutrients to supply um, plant available nitrogen to the plants. It's the fungi that do the work on the nitrate nitrogen. We, comply, com uh, we combine the ammonium and the nitrate nitrogen for a total mineral nitrogen what we're looking at. And this is our results in 2022. Um, Van's really passionate about this. So he's testing since 2019. But what I, what I want to show you here basically is, is what you see here. On, uh, what I'd challenge you is if you'd start doing this on most of the rangeland in, in South Dakota or the Northern Plains, it's going to look a lot like this. We're going to be heavy with soil or mineral nitrogen in the zero to six and weak on the other two. What we're finding this trend to go is things are becoming more equal. You see that we're having more equal proportions of mineral nitrogen throughout the entire depth. That's telling me that we're getting deeper, denser roots. Now we're looking too. We had a couple soil pits out there and we're looking and we're seeing soil aggregation and root depth and rhizosheath and all that fun stuff. But um, our goal based on North Dakota research is our goal is to use that nitrogen on our native plants to, to achieve hundred pounds of production. Once we're at hundred pounds of mineral nitrogen released for our native species, that's when we're gonna keep the invasives out. Oh, well, we hadn't seen a rhizo sheath. There's a cool one. That, that reminds me, How much, do I have any time left? Oh, wow. Five. Okay. Okay, I wanna leave most of it for questions. But, so what do you look for? If you've never looked in the soil for the rhizo sheath, a good question that you would have asked me is say, so which species would you look for for indicators? I don't know, I'm just a rancher. I'm gonna go dig a hole. I know enough about species because I learned it in 4-H or my kid knows it. What are the species I wanna look for? Any guesses? No, you're looking for the grass species. Which native grass species would you look for to get the, to look for the rhizosheath to see if you're going in the right direction? Western wheatgrass, porcupine grass. You'd be like, oh my gosh, Leland, but I don't even have porcupine grass out there. You use a strategy, you will. Within two years, you'll have porcupine grass. Um, how about your warm seasons? 
Any guesses? Someone said big blue stem? It'll come, but the first one, Cytoscrama. And if you're on sandy environments, prairie sand reed. Prairie sand reed is just, it's like Western. It's non-facultative or whatever. And so it's just going to have it. But those are the ones to look for. If you're trying to say, well, what's this thing even looking look like? What's that guy even talking about? Does he know what he's talking about? That's what you want to be looking for. That's porcupine grass right there. All right. So timing of grazing. This is what, I probably don't make a lot of friends this way. But what I hear continuously is, and that's why I say ignore smooth brome grass. We're trying to pound the hell out of this stuff. And what we're doing, especially on, on native rangeland, is we're hurting our natives constantly. If we're out there in late April, early May, when these native plants are trying to grow, we're nipping them off too. Either that or else we're not describing what we really mean by grazing brome grass or bluegrass off in May. You know, maybe we mean to graze it higher, but people are getting the wrong impression. So here's an example. I mean, this is only four years. I mean, this rangeland is not even healthy yet. Scurfy, four inches, mid-May. Porcupine grass, eight inches tall, mid-May. Coneflower, five inches tall, mid-May. Our non-native plants are becoming less competitive. We're getting this native diversity back in that's being driven by, we're repopulating soil organisms is what we're doing. You know, what about the rest of the season? Heck, it's dormant or it's whatever. As long as we don't have snow cover, we're just going to graze it. No, fall tillers are a very special and important component of this. And I hear the information coming out of this college. And it's important. It's bringing attention to fall tillers. So we went out there. Ah, heck, why don't we go out in the field? Because that's fun to do anyways. We clipped 450 pounds of dry matter in January. Fall tillers. And look how green they are. Um, that was oh, 2021, probably. Uh, the spring of 2022, we're out there. May 24th. We're actually before there. But look at this. American vetch flowering at five to six inches tall. If we're out there trying to pound out that brome, we'd be eating that off. We'd be throwing it backwards. Um, November of 21, porcupine grass right here where my finger's at is where it was grazed, probably three inches tall. The rest of this stuff sticking up here is plant recovery. We, we had built into the plan to have the recovery time. And, uh, and you can see it there. That's photosynthesis. That's going to continue to create photosynthesis and feed those soil organisms through the winter. They don't just die or go dormant. We have winter soil organisms too. You know, they can withstand temperatures down to 30 degrees below the soil surface. So those lead and fall tillers are super important. We can't just think that it's free grazing or something. So Provenza, Teague, and Baskin probably say it better than I can. Um, in in Provenza's, Fred Provenza's book, Nourishment. Um, and that's basically this. If you can keep this mindset as you travel around and think about managing rangelands, properly managed, foraging by livestock can enhance biodiversity of rangelands as the plant they consume nutrient life below ground and above ground while sequestering atmospheric carbon. You know, that message right there should satisfy everybody in the world, right? Whether they're grazing or not. And, and using the right timing, the right mechanism through biological effective grazing and the twice over rotational grazing system is the way we're going to restore these native rangeland systems. I'm confident of it. Um, how many of you in the, in the room are real life ranchers? You got livestock at home? Means it. Okay. All right. So what this research has shown, and I've tried to validate it in numbers, because I'm a rancher too. From a rancher's perspective, especially these fall tillers are important. One animal unit might equal 780 pounds. You know, for 30 days is kind of what we're looking at. But anyways, we're increasing for produ forage production by 42%. We're increasing water holding capacity by 44%. Our nutrient density for our forage, therefore, our livestock performance is increased by 14%. And our rhizosphere weight right out here out of North Dakota is 176% compared to what, where we're at probably right now is about 30 or 40% on most of our dysfunctional rangelands. So that's me. That's my story. That's my experience. Um, so some of the questions might be like this, but I'm going to, and, and feel free to offer you know, your questions, but I'm going to say this is whatever mechanism you choose to use on your native rangeland, or as you do as a, as somebody's coach or consultant, whether it's fire or hail or, or a Degelman disc or something, after you think you've solved the problem and you have healthy rangeland, then how are you going to manage it? 
So I'm not, I'm not um, saying that fire and those things aren't the right tools in the right environment, depending on what your situation is. But once you think as a human that you've achieved that goal, then how are you going to manage it? It's got to be managed biologically. And we have the data, over 30 years of data right here out of, out of NDSU, out of North Dakota, that supports what I just showed you. And it's working. So what Van wanted me to leave you, my co-author, is, is he's so excited about this, is he wants you to know that you're all invited to come look. And he got frustrated a few years ago, and he says, why don't people see this? Why don't they come look at it? He was getting so frustrated. I said, we'll just have to show them. That's all we can do. So if you can't travel down to South Central South Dakota, and he'd love to have you, um, follow me on Twitter. A lot of times I have a lot of you know, stuff that I'm discovering out in the field, or I want to show it off. You know, check that out, and, uh, and come look.